Excellent. So uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk today. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about uh, is a study, a survey study that we just did actually through Wake Up Narcolepsy, uh, looking at care uh, for children with narcolepsy. And we did a survey of families, so parents uh, and their children who have narcolepsy, as well as providers, so sleep physicians. Uh, and uh, we'll give you kind of a, a sneak peek at uh, our preliminary results today, uh, uh, that this is uh, your guys' data because it, uh, it was a survey that you all filled out. Um, so to kind of give you a little background and, and tell you why we did this study in the first place. So as you guys have been hearing for the last couple of hours, uh, you know, narcolepsy is not just about feeling sleepy or kind of the core symptoms of narcolepsy related to REM sleep that we're used to talking about. There's a lot more that goes along with it in terms of other medical problems or other mood challenges. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, demonstrated in a few studies. Uh, this is a really nice uh, study that was done by uh, Alexander Cohen and uh, colleagues uh, up at uh, the Mayo Clinic. And they have a, a really beautiful uh, way of looking at uh, kind of epidemiological data up there because they have great records where they can uh, look at particular diagnoses and uh, look at if there are things that fall out along with that compared to uh, other people who do not have that diagnosis and what their rates of those uh, other problems are as well uh, within their county up there uh, in Rochester. And so they looked at individuals with narcolepsy. They were mostly adults. Uh, there were some kids in there, but there was mostly adults. Um, and what they found is kind of no surprise, I'm sure, to people listening, which is there's a lot that goes along with it, a lot of uh, trouble with uh, mood disorders or other psychiatric disorders. Uh, so uh, the gray bar is uh, individuals who have, oops, narcolepsy, and the uh, darker gray bar uh, are individuals who do not have narcolepsy, and this is the percentage of people who uh, are affected by the condition. So you can see a lot more psychiatric disorders. Uh, interestingly, uh, more endocrine disorders, so hormone problems, a lot of sleep apnea, a lot of chronic pain, depression, which we just heard about, uh, weight, uh, which we've touched on a little bit today as well, anxiety we just heard about, thyroid problems, high blood pressure, high uh, cholesterol. So uh, kind of a, a long list of medical problems uh, that tend to come with narcolepsy more often than uh, if, if people did not have narcolepsy. So a lot going on, more than just uh, daytime sleepiness and uh, the core REM symptoms of narcolepsy. Well, what about in kids? What do we know? Uh, so not a ton, but uh, there was a really nice uh, study done uh, by Ann Halbauer and, and, and her colleagues uh, and collaborators looking at kids who have narcolepsy and comparing them to children who do not have narcolepsy. Uh, and they actually looked at a claims database, so an insurance claims database, of over a thousand kids with narcolepsy. This was a really big uh, sample, so a, a great study to look at this. And they looked at really the same thing again, uh, what tends to go with narcolepsy more often uh, compared to people who do not have narcolepsy or children who don't. And they found uh, similar things. Again, a lot tended to go along with it. On average, uh, those kids had five uh, more conditions kind of listed on their chart in addition to uh, narcolepsy compared to children who did not have narcolepsy. They tended to have a lot of respiratory disease, so things like asthma, uh, allergies, uh, upper respiratory infections, uh, as well as mood disorders. Uh, both of those, uh, more than 50%, um, had diagnoses of, of one of those things. Uh, they tended to have more diagnostic testing that had been done. They tended to be in the hospital more, have more visits to the emergency department, more visits to uh, the outpatient office, uh, as well as overall just kind of higher cost of health care that goes along with that. Uh, so they have a lot that's going on um, in these kids, just uh, like we saw with the study from adults. And so, um, you know, medication you heard about earlier today, medication is uh, some wonderful medications, and medications help, and most of the time are needed, uh, but a lot of the time is not enough as we, I uh, just heard that wonderful talk from Molly uh, looking at uh, kind of lifestyle management strategies in uh, individuals who have narcolepsy and, and what can we do that is a non-medication 
uh, option for helping control symptoms and live the life that we want to. Uh, and that was just, I, I love that thought. That was, uh, I wish I could just uh, kind of bottle that up and take a little bit of it every day. But uh, uh, so, uh, you know, Jason Ong and Eric Sao have been looking at uh, this for uh, quite a while and are, uh, and one recent study that uh, he published looked at uh, adults who have hypersomnia and found that about one in four have difficulty taking their medication due to side effects from that medication. And about 90% uh, of the people who responded to his survey use mon medication therapies uh, in addition to their medication to help manage their symptoms uh, for their hypersomnia. Um, and most of those were uh, moderately effective. If they rated on a scale of uh, one to 10, about the average was about six out of a 10 for how well those non-medication therapies uh, were working the, uh, for them. So uh, there, there are definitely uh, you know, people out there, a lot of people out there who are already using non-medication therapies um, to help manage their symptoms. Well, what about in kids? Uh, this is less well studied in kids. Uh, I do want to highlight a really nice uh, paper that was written by uh, the group in Cincinnati where they talk about uh, how we need to talk, you know, think about, yes, all the biological factors that are happening. You know, we all have different kind of uh, gene variants and hormone levels and you know, different neurochemistry and all of this. Uh, but also we need to think about uh, mood uh, and uh, you know, everything that's going along with that, stressors in life, how we're dealing with them, our resilience, um, and what's going on in the world that we're living in, uh, whether that's what's going on at school, within the family unit, um, or other big life events, and how is that affecting uh, that child's functioning. So uh, really kind of putting all of those things together as we're thinking about uh, how do we provide the best care? You know, one way to think about that is with the biopsychosocial model. Uh, so the biological uh, things that we think about, medical things that we think about, uh, psychosocial, so uh, also the um, individual mood um, uh, factors as well as the social context uh, that we're living in. And all of those things play an important role uh, in how eventually we are able to function on a day-to-day -day basis and, and be able to live the life that we want. So for our study, we wanted to build on uh, what those previous researchers had looked at and really answer three big questions. Our, one was we wanted to define the common medical and psychosocial concerns in kids with narcolepsy from the parent's perspective, as well as the child's perspective and the perspective of sleep physicians. So try to get a, a, a kind of looks from three different angles at this issue. Um, number two was to assess uh, family perception of how well uh, their current clinical care needs were aligned with what they were actually receiving. Uh, you know, are there areas where we could uh, be better? And number three, um, ask, ask families and providers, uh, you know, if you could kind of design the ideal narcolepsy clinic or the ideal uh, way to receive care, what would that look like? Uh, what would it the configuration be, who would be involved, uh, what services would be provided, uh, so that we can hopefully uh, eventually, you know, optimally meet those care needs uh, of children with narcolepsy. So those were our three big goals. Uh, people always uh, get embarrassed when you put big pictures of them up, uh, so I thought I'd do that uh, with my collaborators on this study. So uh, Stacy Simon is uh, a pediatric sleep psychologist at uh, Children's Colorado. Uh, she's very helpful and is, continues to be very helpful with it. Lindsay and Claire, you guys already know, with Wake Up Narcolepsy. Uh, and Wake Up Narcolepsy uh, funded this study, so we're very grateful to their support. Uh, as well as was uh, a vehicle to distribute the survey uh, to families and patients. So uh, they played a big role in this study. Uh, and the results I'm going to present today are under review, so it should be uh, considered as preliminary uh, uh, as I present them. So uh, for really part one of the study, we were looking at what are the challenges that we're facing? So uh, we developed the survey with the help of uh, uh, my collaborators, uh, and we distributed it via Wake Up Narcolepsy, and we left it open for about two months. Uh, overall, about 250 people opened the survey link at all, 
Uh, and of those, 116 parents, uh, 35 youth, and 30 sleep physicians completed the entire survey, uh, which was uh, pretty long. Uh, so we're very grateful to those people for participating and uh, being patient and actually completing the whole thing. Uh, that was very helpful. So thank you if you're one of those people. Uh, so what were our findings? So uh, to start off with, we just asked about the usual things, symptoms that you think about in terms of narcolepsy, uh, right? Daytime sleepiness and then the REM related symptoms. So of course, uh, uh, there's no um, a surprise. Daytime sleepiness was number one as uh, a challenge that people are facing. Both youth and parents reported that. Uh, and then here are our typical REM related symptoms down here. So cataplexy, hallucinations, paralysis. Uh, but you can see that they're down on the list compared to two other core symptoms or what we think of as core symptoms now of narcolepsy uh, that you've heard about earlier today. Uh, one is disturbed nighttime sleep and how that is a, a really important feature of narcolepsy that uh, is disruptive. Uh, so that was actually our number two most important, most frequent, uh, and, and, and largest problem for families. Uh, and number three, you also just heard about depression and mood challenges, which is why we've had a couple of talks on that today. Uh, this is something that is uh, really commonly a challenge. Uh, so at least three days a week, the majority, um, and we ask the same uh, question in terms of, does this pose a medium or big problem for you kind of in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, same order. Uh, in terms of the responses that we got with, yeah, with disturbed nighttime sleep and mood challenges as very important uh, and something that people are ch challenged with on a frequent basis uh, in a big way. Parents did tend to relate uh, more frequent uh, sleep-related hallucinations, uh, but again, still further down on the list. Then we came up with a, a very long list of uh, possible psychosocial challenges, uh, in addition to uh, those core symptoms of narcolepsy that we usually think about. Um, and uh, the list was actually initially a lot longer than this. We whittled it down and we asked people about these specific things uh, and asked them how, uh, how many of these things are medium or big problems in your life. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things here we asked about, but just kind of stepping back, uh, big picture when I look at this, uh, the first thing I notice is golly, I mean, if I just draw a line here at 50%, so at least 50, half of the people who filled out our survey uh, are struggling with this as a big problem in their life. That is the majority of the things that we asked about. I mean, almost all of them. So difficulty focusing and memory, uh, I think earlier in the day, there was a question about ADHD or, or focus uh, uh, as a part of uh, narcolepsy. Worrying about the future, schoolwork, um, uh, we've touched on, uh, uh, mood or getting easily upset, uh, diet and nutrition, you heard a little bit about earlier today. Uh, and that'll kind of come up in several of our, our results as well. Uh, lack of motivation, feeling sad or down, feeling worried, um, dealing with going to college or entering the workforce, um, feeling awkward in social situations or feeling socially isolated, having some problems in relationships, feeling shame um, came up with frequently as well. Uh, other behavioral problems, uh, medication side effects. Uh, I was a little bit surprised, right? Still a lot of people are struggling with that, but it's, it's further down on the list uh, than maybe I would have uh, guessed. Driver's license also farther down on the list is something that uh, I would have guessed has been a major problem. Uh, injuring, of course, you know, so injury uh, or self-harm uh, and transition to adult care lower on the list, uh, still very important, uh, but lower on the list. Uh, so take kind of a, um, and by the way, there was no difference in terms of what kids reported and adults reported. Uh, none of these were statistically different. Uh, so they were pretty much on the same page. Uh, in terms of these things. So to kind of take a mental picture of this and compare it to this graph. So these are the same problems that we asked about uh, down here, right? Focus memory, work, worrying about the future, et cetera. But now we ask sleep physicians. Um, and these are their responses. We asked them, how frequently are your patients, uh, how frequently are these concerns of your patients or the families that you're seeing? 
Uh, and you can see overall, big picture, uh, they, in general, we reported uh, much less uh, concern for these things, or, or at least perceived concern uh, for almost all of these things. Uh, the things that were higher on the sleep physicians list uh, were medication side effects, which makes kind of sense because uh, right, that's what we're doing. We're prescribing medications is a large part of what we do. And we worry about driver's license. We worry about driving safety. Uh, and we're pretty on board. We're pretty in tune with school and, and work. Uh, and we also, it looks like we uh, recognize difficulty focusing in memory. But all these other things, we seem to be somewhat uh, missing the boat on those or not perceiving those as challenges uh, with our patients. Uh, but when we ask our patients, those almost all, you know, the majority of them are saying that these are challenges that they're dealing with. Uh, so we're missing this, I think. Um, how about uh, other medical problems? So those were psychosocial concerns. Uh, then we ask about a whole list of medical problems, uh, like I showed you from those two studies earlier. Um, and <clears throat> a few things uh, that were interesting here, yes, again, anxiety, depression, allergies, uh, weight problems were you know, high on the list, asthma, uh, like we saw in those other studies. Uh, but uh, number one, actually, uh, were vision problems. And that was uh, somewhat surprising to me. I didn't expect that. Uh, but it's interesting. And, and we didn't uh, dig more specifically in this study into what uh, types of vision problems uh, were they having, uh, and how severe were they, or exactly what's going on there. Uh, so we're just kind of speculating, but uh, I, I wonder if that could be related to um, uh, uh, as kind of a marker of uh, daytime sleepiness uh, or resulting in blurry vision or, or pupillary control, uh, things like that. So uh, that caught my attention. I thought it was really interesting and something that we need to look more into. Uh, when we looked at these uh, uh, medical problems and uh, broke it down by type one versus type two narcolepsy, like you heard about before type one with cataplexy, type two without, uh, individuals with type 1 narcolepsy tended to actually have less depression and anxiety uh, in our sample uh, compared to those individuals with type 2 narcolepsy. Uh, that was interesting. And the other thing uh, that fell out from that was that individuals with type 1 narcolepsy tended to have more uh, struggles with obesity compared to people with type 2 narcolepsy. Uh, parents tended to report uh, more often sleep apnea than kids, but uh, otherwise uh, they were fairly uh, well in agreement. And then, you know, uh, we wanted to ask some open-ended questions because, you know, our, maybe our survey uh, was too restrictive and, and we wanted to kind of pick people's brain and just let them uh, talk or, or type out their thoughts uh, the way that they want to express them. So uh, we asked them, if your child did not have narcolepsy, uh, how would his or her life be different? And then we look for themes in those responses, and we look for themes that tended to fall out more frequently than not. Um, and a lot of the same things fell out uh, in these responses uh, as compared to the challenges that I just went over. So, uh, so there maybe would have more positive relationships or better social kind of functioning or, uh, or better social life if they didn't have narcolepsy. They would be more successful in life. They would have a more full life or they, you know, they would perceive that uh, maybe they would have a more full life or have definitely energy um, and maybe would have less struggle with mood. So a lot of the same things that we've already talked about. So how do we kind of take all of those challenges and uh, make something actionable, make something uh, practical that can be used in the real world. Uh, and I loved when Molly was talking about how do you best work with your sleep provider. I was just like, oh my gosh, not in my head, vigorously. All those things that she was talking about are so helpful. You know, having that sleep diary filled up beforehand and that sleep diary that she referenced from ASM is wonderful because it is uh, easy to look at that. Uh, and then her tips for kind of making a list uh, and deciding what is most important for you for that visit, golden, right? Because in reality, uh, that time that you have for that visit is somewhat limited uh, with your provider, and you want to make sure that you get out of that visit uh, what you wanted uh, rather than kind of getting off track. So one thing that we came up with based on the results of this survey was 
pre, uh, pediatric narcolepsy pre-visit worksheet. So the idea behind this would be that this is something you could print out, fill out before you go to your visit with your provider so that uh, it allows you to kind of focus in on what the challenges are that you're currently experiencing and what you want to talk about with them. And this is 100% uh, based on those survey results we just went over. So uh, if you look at, oops, if you look at these challenges here uh, that I listed, I actually listed them in exactly the same order uh, in terms of the frequency that, uh, were, were, um, that we got from our survey. Uh, so here's the core symptoms uh, that we talked about, the psychosocial challenges, uh, the, and then finally the medical comorbidities. Uh, these are uh, perfectly reflective of the survey results that we got. And then the other thing uh, is, of course, treatment. What are we doing medication-wise and behavioral-wise or psychosocially-wise to help manage our, our narcolepsy? So uh, I want people to list out the medications that they're taking, and that helps, uh, uh, does a couple things. One is uh, and make sure that we have those right uh, in our system when you come and see us. But two, uh, and make sure that you know, the, the family is very familiar with what medications and doses that they're on uh, as well. So it can sometimes, it can be a little bit educational as well. And then behavioral therapies, what lifestyle or behavioral strategies are you currently using for your narcolepsy? Uh, and maybe there are some things, maybe there aren't anything, but maybe this would maybe get us thinking about those things as well. Uh, the other thing I didn't say was that very first uh, question, do you have type one or type two narcolepsy? Uh, and I've, I've been kind of surprised. I've been having uh, people fill this out now uh, when they come in for the last several months, and a lot of people don't know. Uh, and so I may have that reflected a lack of education uh, that I was providing uh, for my patients, but uh, that can sometimes be a conversation starter as well, just to kind of know the, uh, uh, make sure that we know the basics and, and know what we're dealing with. Uh, and then last, but most important, what's the most important thing you want to talk to uh, your doctor about today? Uh, so that we make sure that we aren't missing that uh, and we're addressing uh, what you guys wanna, wanna talk about uh, before you leave that visit. So this was something practical we thought that we could um, uh, put out there for people uh, if they wanted to use it uh, based on the results uh, of the survey that we did. And we hope we find that uh, people find it helpful. So part two of the survey uh, was management, right? What are we going to do to help people uh, optimally manage their narcolepsy? And really, uh, there are kind of three components to that. Uh, one is, what are we doing for therapy? So medication and non-medication therapies. What kind of specialist care uh, are they getting? Um, and what does their sleep clinic care look like um, as well? So uh, we'll kind of uh, go through each of those things one at a time. This is a busy slide, but I kind of wanted to, to share this data with you guys. So we asked people um, what treatments that they were doing and were they generally helpful, not generally helpful? Uh, were they uh, treatments that they wouldn't even consider? Uh, or were they treatments that they had tried but they had to stop due to side effects? And just because of that, we, there's a huge amount of data then for that. I just, I just pulled out those uh, treatments that people said were generally helpful, and then um, what percentage of people said that. Um, and I listed them here in order uh, by what the youth said, what kids said. Uh, and so we asked youth, parents, and physicians, okay? And so big picture, when I step back and I look at all these numbers, first thing that I notice is, uh, okay, uh, 60, 70% here kind of at the top, then 20s and 30s kind of in the middle, and then we're getting the single digits here at the bottom. But look at the physicians, man. Uh, we really think that uh, uh, our therapies are extraordinarily uh, helpful uh, for our patients uh, to you know the tune of eighty or ninety percent for a lot of these. Uh, you know, I think we really want to feel like we're doing good. Uh, so, but that's a little bit discordant from uh, what kids and their parents were saying in terms of how effective these therapies were. So. But the other thing I notice is if you just look at the order of these things in terms of how effective they are, uh, it is really a mix of both medication and non-medication therapies, uh, right? And, and look at the first four, daytime naps, scheduled bedtime, wake time, exercise, and diet. 
uh, my goodness. So the first four are not medications. They are lifestyle things uh, that we can be doing that are generally helpful. Uh, and uh, that is, I think, really important and stresses how important these non-medication therapies are in addition to the medications. And then we kind of get the usual suspects, right? We've heard today uh, earlier about traditional stimulants, sodium oxybate, uh, modafinil and armodafinil uh, as uh, medications that can be very helpful, antidepressants for, uh, to help suppress our REM sleep and, and help, help with those uh, symptoms. Uh, and then we get into kind of uh, a smattering of other things. Uh, some of these things I think uh, are lower on the list just because they're so new, right? So you've heard about how Pitolacent and Solriamphetol are new medications. So uh, people just haven't had a chance to use them. And I think probably if we were to repeat this uh, in a few years when more people have had a chance, um, they would, I mean, I speculate that they would probably be higher in the list. I'm guessing that's why they're so low. Um, the other thing was uh, CBD. I don't know what to say about CBD, uh, so please don't ask me. Um, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of kids uh, uh, responded that they found, uh, not a lot, but 20%, uh, so that they found it as generally helpful. Uh, and I don't have the, the data here presented for you, but a lot of people were, uh, parents and kids were interested in learning more. Uh, zero physicians thought that this was helpful. and zero wanted to talk about it. None of them uh, essentially wanted to talk about it. So, and I think is we just don't know, uh, right? So uh, I would just kind of view it uh, just like any other chemical, any other substance. Uh, uh, there's nothing inherently good or bad about it. It's just needs to be studied and, and see if it's effective and see if it's safe or not. Uh, and uh, as of right now, we just don't know. Um, so a, a few things that I see when I, I look at this list of potential therapies, but the big things for me were non-medication therapies uh, are extremely important uh, in addition to medications. So again, how well do kids, so youth, their parents uh, agree? Uh, this was, I took all those uh, potential treatments and I ranked them, you know, one through uh, 23. Uh, and then I just plotted them out. In general, kids and, kids and their parents agree pretty well. Uh, but then when you throw physicians in there, we start to get some spread, especially lower on the list, uh, like we pointed out earlier, uh, for both uh, looking at physicians and youth and physicians and parents. Uh, so a little bit of discordance in terms of what we think works uh, when, when we ask physicians versus uh, the families that they're treating. So that was kind of part uh, one of therapy. Part two is uh, what specialists are people seeing? What specialists do they think are very important? Uh, and what specialists are currently available uh, within their clinics? So uh, the most frequent uh, are not a surprise, and I'm glad people are uh, seeing uh, mental health specialists, so psychology and psychiatry, so that's wonderful uh, that a lot of people are hooked into those services already. Uh, and then a smattering of others, cardiology, GI, and endocrine. Uh, and again, and that's a couple of times that we've mentioned uh, endocrine or hormone problems, which I think is interesting. Uh, and then we asked people, uh, uh, kids and their parents, what, who do they think is very important to see? Again, uh, mental health, number one, psychologist. Uh, psychiatrists also pretty high on that list. Uh, a couple of other things uh, that fell out, dietitian, uh, very important uh, uh, when we ask families. Uh, and then social worker has been mentioned a few times. Uh, also very important, someone that can help uh, uh, get resources as well as sometimes help interface with schools uh, or work situations. Uh, social worker can be uh, your best friend. And then we asked docs, uh, what if, which of these people are available, number one, in your clinic, uh, or number two, if not available in your clinic, uh, by referral? Uh, so. Most, uh, actually about three quarters had a nurse in their clinic. About a quarter had a psychologist in their clinic, which is uh, amazing, that's great. Uh, of course, we want that to be 100%, but that's, you know, that's great. Uh, and most also had uh, that available by referral. Uh, about 20% had a social worker and about half by referral. Love to see that number higher. 
Uh, dietitian, uh, they could usually refer out, but it was a rare thing to have in their clinic. Uh, and then same with psychiatrists. Uh, and we also asked about obesity specialists because weight issues uh, are, as we talked about, very common uh, challenges. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, available by referral, but as of right now, not available in anybody's clinic. And then uh, what would uh, kind of going to the sleep clinic look like? Uh, how frequently, who would they want to see, and what other aspects uh, of support uh, are important for people. So in terms of how frequently they want uh, or they feel like would be uh, important for them to go to clinic, uh, parents and physicians felt like three to, every three to four months would be ideal uh, to kind of really kind of keep on top of things and, and optimally manage symptoms. Uh, kids, uh, maybe not quite as often, maybe every six months or so. Uh, was the most frequent response that we got. Uh, we asked them if they're seeing multiple providers or specialists uh, that they need. So for example, their uh, sleep provider and a psychologist or sleep provider and a dietitian or whatever that is. Uh, we asked them would they prefer uh, separate day visits, so separate appointments to keep things a little bit shorter uh, or uh, would they like it all at once? Uh, you know, the disadvantage of that is that's a longer appointment. That's a long time to be there in clinic. Uh, and most people wanted all those encounters to take place in the same clinic on the same day. Uh, especially parents and physicians, kids, not so much, maybe half, uh, but parents and physicians had a strong preference for that. And when we talk about kind of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary care as a model, uh, that, that's really hitting home. Uh, in terms of that. Uh, we asked about um, other uh, supports uh, that people could have. So for example, a narcolepsy support group. Um, most had not um, been to a narcolepsy support group locally, uh, but most that hadn't were interested in having uh, such a support group or going to such a support group. Um, and if you're listening to this and that's something that, uh, that you're interested in, I mean, you can, you can check locally, but also if there doesn't happen to be one, uh, or if you would feel more comfortable, especially now in the pandemic, the, again, uh, putting in a plug in for the wake up narcolepsy support groups online are uh, a wonderful resource to, to utilize. Um, and also a family education day, like we're doing right now. Uh, most people had not been to one, but most were interested in, in attending one. Uh, and the narcolepsy camp, like, uh, wake Up Narcolepsy puts on. Uh, most uh, had not been to one, but most were interested in learning more about that. So uh, these are other services or supports that individuals with narcolepsy, I think, are interested in, can be helpful, um, but are maybe underutilized right now and are really wonderful things to look into uh, if you're listening. Uh, another aspect I wanted to look at uh, with with this was what about quality measures? You know, we can kind of come up with these great ideas for how to deliver care, but how do we know if we're doing a good job? How do we know if we're getting better? Uh, and so the American Academy of Sleep Medicine uh, came up with these really nice uh, quality measures uh, that they suggested that clinics track for all sleep disorders, really, so uh, obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, uh, et cetera, uh, but they also came up with them for narcolepsy. Uh, and the idea was these were uh, kind of uh, practical, real-world uh, outcomes of interest that measure how well we're delivering care, uh, so process measures, as well as outcomes eventually. And so it's a great idea. Uh, and we wanted to see how often is this actually happening? And what do families think about this too? Do they think that we should be tracking these things? And if we do, do they think that we should be publicly reporting them so that this is something that, uh, you know, you can go online and look up or something like that so you're able to uh, see how well your clinic's doing. So when we asked parents, uh, about 60% of them said, yes, we should track and we should publicly report them. And uh, everybody else said, yes, you should track them, uh, but they didn't feel strongly about the need to publicly report them. When we asked physicians, again, almost universally, people say, yes, we should track these quality measures. Uh, and, that, and really that should say, should track quality measures, not track. Um, but most didn't want to publicly report them. Uh, and uh, when I asked uh, the physicians how many are actually right now tracking these quality measures, it was only about one in three 
uh, that are currently doing it, uh, which, uh, you know, is, is not where we want to be, uh, but I, I think is understandable uh, because uh, there, um, there's a lot of uh, kind of boxes that uh, we're, we're being asked to check and, and things that we're asked to uh, track uh, clinically for a lot of reasons uh, in clinics. Uh, in the healthcare system right now. And so adding another uh, thing to that, uh, you know, creates challenges. It's another, uh, it's another thing that requires resources, time and effort uh, to, to track that and do so in a good way. Uh, so I, I think everybody wants to do this. It's just a matter of practically, how do we actually do this in the real world and fit that into everything else that we're already supposed to be doing. Uh, so uh, something that uh, kind of we'll kind of keep an eye on uh, as time goes by, and I, I probably um, there are going to be efforts to try to um, have kind of a centralized uh, a way of tracking and reporting these measures. I hope I, I think that that would uh, make it easier for physicians to be able to track that and input that data somewhere, as well as track that across uh, clinics across the country to kind of have some benchmarks uh, for everybody, so that we can get feedback in terms of how well we're doing. Uh, so I think these are gonna be really important for uh, improving our care that we're providing. Okay, uh, the next several uh, slides I'm gonna go over are really busy and kind of hard to look at, but again, they were uh, these open-ended questions where we asked families uh, a, a lot of things about the care that they were receiving and what they liked and what they didn't like. Okay, basically. So uh, we asked people, what's the most valuable or helpful thing about the care provided by your sleep clinic? Okay, um, listening, okay. Uh, that came through in the comments I read over and over and again. And the thing that came through uh, wasn't just listening, it was specifically, uh, they listen to my child uh, and the concerns that my child has. So I think as providers, that's something that we need to remember as very important uh, and sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's easy to ask the parent and, and not ask the child, uh, that kind of thing. So that came through very frequently. Uh, of course, medications are helpful, people like that. Um, willingness was another thing that came through frequently. And by willingness, uh, people would write about uh, their provider or their physician was willing to try new things uh, or willing to listen to uh, new treatments that uh, uh, people are interested in uh, and maybe give those a try. So kind of an open-mindedness, uh, a willingness to listen, and also listening to the child was very important. Uh, what do you wish was a part of the care provided by your sleep clinic or provider that is currently absent? So how could we be better, essentially? Uh, access to a lot of other providers, so that multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach that we've been talking about, uh, where you're seeing specialists from a lot of different areas to really try to uh, uh, optimally manage all the problems that come along with narcolepsy. Uh, same thing that came through frequently. The other thing that came through frequently, which is like sometimes when you ask a question, you have to kind of eat a little bit of humble pie, uh, was a lot of comments about, uh, boy, I wish my provider knew more about uh, you know, with current narcolepsy research that's coming out or the new medications or new information. Uh, so I think as providers, we need to make sure that, you know, we're kind of keeping up to date uh, with all of the newest stuff because uh, sometimes we're given the impression that we aren't, I think. Uh, so a uh, little lesson there for, for me and, and my other uh, cohort of sleep providers. Uh, what would the ideal sleep clinic visit look like for your child's narcolepsy? Uh, if you could envision this, what would it look like? Again, multiple subspecialists or that multidisciplinary team approach came through as number one by far. Uh, are there any other issues that your child sleep doctor is not currently addressing that they, you wish that they would? Uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of the symptom issues that we already talked about came through frequently. Um, and then also kind of the social and emotional impact of having narcolepsy. So the biopsychosocial things that we've been talking about. Uh, frequently. What's the most common or, uh, or I'm sorry, what is the most valuable or uh, helpful thing about the care provided? Um, they listen to me, again, listening, uh, and that, uh, you know, they provide medication. Medication, obviously, is a really important thing, uh, part of what we do uh, in the sleep clinic. So people like that, of course. What do you like least about your sleep clinic appointment? 
uh, long wait times and getting there. Uh, so uh, those, and, and there were a lot of uh, comments in there about telemedicine um, and, and then wait times to get into clinic. And so um, you know, I wonder how things will evolve here over the next uh, months to years in terms of utilizing telemedicine more uh, so that we're able to provide care to people who do not live close to their sleep clinic uh, on a more frequent and more convenient basis. Uh, I think that's something that a lot of people are going to be looking at, uh, and I think a, a lot of families and patients may have a preference for, uh, so that it cuts down on travel time. Uh, what do you wish was a part of the care provided that is not currently missing? So uh, support groups, um, like we've um, uh, talked about, um, and also having other multidisciplinary care teams. Uh, what would it look like? Greater engagement and discussion. Um, uh, more of the same stuff, multidisciplinary care again. Um, and then what suggestions uh, would you give to your sleep doctor to improve the care of uh, children and adolescents with narcolepsy in the future? So how can we be better? Um, so events, uh, providing information about events like this or other support services was number one. Um, be an advocate and try to educate uh, both families as well as people in the community about narcolepsy was actually number two. And then again, listening to your patient uh, and providing holistic or more comprehensive care uh, came through uh, as well. How about the physicians? Uh, when we asked them a couple questions, uh, we got very clear answers um, about what they think. So uh, what do you wish was different about the way that you deliver care to your patients with narcolepsy? Multidisciplinary team. Boom, number one for sure, uh, almost universally. Uh, and if you could design the ideal narcolepsy clinic, what would it look like? Again, same thing, universally, multidisciplinary care team uh, where you've got uh, this team approach to care, a comprehensive holistic approach, uh, rather than uh, one person who's uh, just prescribing medication so that we're helping to uh, better address all of these concerns uh, that come with having narcolepsy. So what were my big takeaways from uh, the survey that we did? Number one, uh, the psychosocial challenges uh, that we've touched on are really common. Uh, and as, as physicians, maybe for a lot of them, we aren't perceiving them or uh, properly asking about them uh, to really uh, appreciate how often those are occurring uh, for our patients and their families. Uh, and there are also a lot of uh, medical problems that go along with having narcolepsy in kids uh, that occur at a high rate. Uh, number two, medications are, are really helpful and you've heard, already heard about uh, many medications and, and I encourage you to stick around for the talks uh, uh, coming up where you'll maybe hear about some of these newer medications. Medications are generally helpful. Uh, and at the same time, non-medication therapies are extraordinarily important and should be a part of uh, kind of holistic or integrative uh, care uh, that we're providing and people are, are asking for and seeking so that they can uh, optimally manage the narcolepsy and everything that comes with it. And number three, uh, thinking about what is the best framework to uh, deliver that care in, uh, in this way, really interdisciplinary care, is with a biopsychosocial model, like we talked about at the very beginning, I think would be the ideal way to do that. Um, and you can look at uh, a lot of examples uh, of other uh, uh, clinics and other disorders where this is being done. Uh, for example, uh, the kind of gold standard example I can think of is cystic fibrosis. And these kids with cystic fibrosis have a lot of other medical and psychosocial challenges that come along with having that. Uh, and so uh, the, the CF Foundation has uh, been a wonderful way to kind of distribute a care model and track outcomes uh, across the country where uh, they're looking uh, uh, at uh, outcomes over time and they've seen a wonderful improvement in outcomes by applying a interdisciplinary care model where they're seeing a, uh, a team of people when they come in for their visit, uh, including their medical provider, uh, pharmacist, social worker, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, that are targeted at those uh, various areas uh, where they have struggles. And so I think that the same idea 
uh, can be applied within narcolepsy uh, and help us uh, better care for our patients. Uh, so that's kind of big picture what I think and kind of my dream uh, for how I want my clinic to be better uh, and what I dream my, for my clinic to be like one day uh, for my patients. Uh, so uh, thank you again and I'd be happy to, to do my best to answer questions if there are any. Um, I appreciate, appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Ingram. So much content um, in that presentation and also, um, you know, so many months work gone into these uh, results, which I hope will bear much fruit for families affected by narcolepsy. We are about to go into a break. However, it's only 15 minutes. And so I do offer that to those of you who would like to step away. But for others who would like to stick around, let's just go for some questions for the next 15 minutes before we hear from our pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I have a few, Dave. So uh, the all about CBD. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did pick that up actually there were a few but I think maybe there um, we should maybe have a conversation about that some other time and sort of address some of those things okay so we have one here the problem we have as parents is to get my teenager to be honest with the doctor and admit the issues he is having with his type 1 narcolepsy I do go to visits with the doctor and I've tried leaving the room hoping he would admit to such things such as anger and mood but it's not been successful but as his parents, this is frustrating. We are not sure how to handle him or this situation. And I'm hoping Dr. Ingram's data will help open discussion. We see friendship, relationships, social issues that he doesn't see. Have you got any comments on that? Because I think that's probably a representative um, question to especially teenagers and the dynamics between um, that age group and parents in the clinic. Yeah, I mean... Um, so, I, I, my guess is that would um, stem from a place of feeling alone and feeling like nobody else would struggle with this or nobody else uh, uh, would have trouble with this. There's something wrong with me. I, I, I don't want to share that. I feel shame about that or I feel guilt about that or something like that. And, and, and that would uh, kind of provide a barrier to, to asking for help or sharing that with people. So, I, I think the first thing for, for people to realize and kids to realize is they're not alone. Most people uh, who have narcolepsy, most kids with narcolepsy are struggling probably with the same things that you are. Um, and so it, it probably if you tell us something, it's not gonna be the first or second or third time that we've heard it. Uh, if I see someone and they're telling me everything is great uh, and perfect and they have no problems and they're uh, you know, in a wonderful mood all the time, uh, I am shocked and I, I kind of suspect that maybe they are holding things back. And so, uh, so I, I think be open, uh, share. And if you, uh, if you don't share and, and are open with the people who are trying to help you, it's really, that makes it hard to help. Uh, uh, so we can only kind of help with the things that we know about. So, so just know that you're not alone. Um, most people are going through the same things that you are. Thank you. I think this um, has bearing on the next question and might reflect also how parents can feel ashamed to, to sort of be honest in a new clinic situation. What kind of behavioral challenges are common in children with narcolepsy? What type? Yes, yeah, so, um, so all that huge list uh, uh, that we went through uh, when I was going through my slides, so uh, a ton uh, and frequently. Uh, and I think specific to narcolepsy, things that also people uh, can find a struggle in terms of behavioral problems are st sticking with a routine, sticking with the medication regimen, taking the medication um, like they're supposed to at the time that you're supposed to, which can be hard, you know. Uh, it's hard to, do, to always do things like you're supposed to be doing. And then um, we talked about folks and concentration problems. Uh, if we're irritable, uh, that makes us hard uh, to kind of deal with sometimes and to uh, function and have the relationships that we want to have uh, kind of be in harmony, uh, like we would want them to be in to function in school or function at our job or whatever. Uh, so a whole range of, of trouble um, uh, that people deal with um, is frequent. Sorry, looking at the model that you're proposing from your study, a multidisciplinary team approach, how has telehealth worked out for you over the last few months? 
um, during the pandemic? And do you see um, that maybe being a way forward, even hopefully once we're through this season? That's a great question. Um, and uh, it, so it's a, overall, I like it. Um, and overall, I think my patients like it uh, mm -hmm. for several reasons. Uh, one, it's convenient for them. They can do it mm -hmm. actually from home a lot of the time. Uh, they don't have to go to a facility and expose themselves or travel. Um, I think that there are some challenges that come with it that we've uh, encountered. One is, okay, what platform are we gonna use? Um, and, you know, does that have all the proper security and privacy? Okay. And, all that? and then is that something that people can usually use on their end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be a little bit computer savvy uh, to be able to use these platforms. Uh, or maybe someone doesn't have a computer. Or maybe someone doesn't have an internet connection. Uh, so there, I think there are some, uh, some kind of practical barriers to that. The other practical barrier uh, from kind of the uh, hospital administration side is uh, we're providing a service how do we uh, get you know, supported for that? How do we get reimbursed for that? We have kind of a system for uh, when you come into the clinic, you know, we, we charge a fee for the fact that you saw me and, and then we charge a fee for the fact that you came to our building you know, and we have to put, keep the lights on. Uh, but how do we do that uh, when it's just done over the computer? Uh, and some insurances are um, supportive of that, uh, sometimes, uh, it's not, and, and sometimes it's really hard to even sort that out. Uh, so I think that is a, a, a major uh, thing that needs to be kind of addressed moving forward so that hospitals are able to do this. Um, but I, I personally think it's great. Um, and while I have not done a multidisciplinary clinic televisit with individuals with narcolepsy, I am a part of another uh, multidisciplinary clinic um, and we have done that. Uh, with the telemedicine platform. And it's worked out actually fairly well um, uh, for that clinic. And so I, I think that it's doable. Um, I think that there's just some practical things that needed to be sorted out uh, moving forward. And I, I hope it is more common and uh, is more utilized. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how things kind of shake out once this pandemic's over in terms of providing um, a multidisciplinary approach to treatment, but maybe remotely throw that, maybe throw that into the next research, I don't know. Um, so I wanted to touch on another issue that came up about driving and how much does that um, affect families that you see in your clinic and what do you recommend um, for children, uh, teens, emerging young adults who want to drive and who have narcolepsy? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so I, I worry about driving uh, because I want to make sure that my patients are safe. Um, and so what is the best uh, way that I can to ensure them to be able to still do that and still have autonomy, uh, and, but do so in a kind of a responsible, safe way. So, uh, and everybody kind of does it differently. Um, so your particular provider may have their own way of doing it and that's fine. There's no set in stone way uh, that's the, re the right way to kind of um, uh, uh, screen for and, and say someone is safe to drive. But uh, in the past, when we've done uh, a survey of pediatric sleep providers and asked them that question, what are you doing in clinic? Uh, basically, a couple of things fell out. One was, first thing that they want to hear is that the family is telling them everything is going pretty well. We have our symptoms uh, well under control. Uh, we feel fairly confident that you know, we're able to stay alert at the wheel. Uh, so that's number one is just subjectively, how do you think you're doing? And if we're not there yet, then okay, we need to uh, tinker around with what we're doing with our treatment so that we can get you there. Uh, and then number two uh, is, is there some way that we can objectively uh, demonstrate that you're actually able to stay awake and be alert? Uh, and about half of uh, sleep physicians uh, think that that is an important piece to demonstrate. So not everybody, a lot of people don't think that that piece is terribly important, but some do. Uh, and the way that currently we have, the tool that we have, is to do a test called a MWT or a maintenance of wakefulness test, which if you remember uh, going through your MSLT where it's a nap test, right? You're put in a room and you, they turn out the lights and they say, go to sleep and you say, no problem. Uh, the, this is the opposite of that. Uh, we put you in a room with the EEG and everything hooked up and we dim the lights down and you're kind of sitting in a chair uh, and uh, we say, stay awake. And then uh, we give you 40 minutes. Uh, 
to demonstrate that you're able to stay awake. Uh, and we do that four times throughout the day. So it's a whole day thing. It's uh, not a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, if someone is able to do that, uh, that's, boy, that shows to me, uh, they are really uh, alert uh, to, and we're able to show that to the best of our ability. That's not a perfect test, of course. It doesn't actively reflect, you know, being in the driver's seat. Uh, and so maybe uh, as time goes on, there will be other approaches that are developed, like using driving simulators uh, or other things uh, that are more representative. I, I'm really looking forward to the day when we have those. Uh, and the other issue to keep in mind is your particular state that you listen, uh, that you live in. Uh, I think that you're giving me the, the time signal, so I'll wrap it up. Uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, so all of the driving laws and everything are, are specific to your state. Uh, so it's very important that you're familiar with those uh, regulations in your motor vehicle uh, division within the state that you live. Uh, and within the country that you live, because it is different everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, and I think uh, I think we're uh, kind of running out of time.